Stock staging a comeback today and now on track to break their longest weekly losing streak in decades. And while growth stocks are leading the comeback, our next guest is always on the hunt for value names. Scott Black, the founder and president of Delphi Management. It's always good to see you. Nice to have you back. Well, thank you for inviting me, Scott. So I want to ask you first and foremost about, about the environment before we get to some stock picks, because there is a suggestion that as if growth has bottomed, that you're going to start to have money come out of value sectors and go back into growth. And I'm wondering what you think about that. I don't try to make a determination what's going to do better. I mean, since I started Delphi in 1980, we've been trying to buy growth companies at value prices. And so we're really agnostic about whether growth versus value. But I'll put it mm. this way, though, the market, even with today's rally, is still slightly expensive. It's about 18.1 times this year's expected S&P earnings. And then if you look at small cap, like the Russell 2000, that's almost 20 times earnings, and the NASDAQ's about 22 multiple. While we've had major pullbacks, stocks are still slightly on the expensive side. What's an appropriate multiple, then, in your mind? Well... I'm not a big believer in the Federal Reserve. I know the market rallied on the Fed notes today. They were going to have a 50 basis point hike in June and July. I think it's going to take much more than 100 basis points to bring out inflation. I was around in 1981 when Mr. Volcker took over and Ronald Reagan was president. Of course, interest rates lifted into double digits. So I don't think 100 basis points does the trick in, in taking inflation down from the 8 plus percent level to 2 or 2.5 percent. So, you know, a historic norm on the P.E. is around 16 times. And the fact that interest rates should still back up, the, I know the 10-year went out today at 2.75 percent, but I could foresee something in the 3.5 to 4 percent level on the 10-year before the year is out, and that would mean that multiples would contract. So if the historic norm is somewhere around a 16 P.E., we're slightly overvalued here. And one day wow. doesn't make a bull market. I would caution your viewers today, you know, not to chase the fastball up on the strike zone. Yeah, no, I hear you. You, you, you pay a steep price if you do that because uh, the next one comes up and in, and that's not fun. Equinor, <laughs> that's one of your picks. E-Q-N-R. Frankly, I haven't heard about it. Tell me about sure, it. Sure, but it's the old Stott Oil. It's owned two-thirds by the government. It's the old Norse Hydro. And basically, you know, they have the whole North Sea, the shelf in Norway and the U.K. They're big in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a $37 stock, 3.23 um, billion shares for about 120 billion market capital with about a 2.2 percent yield. And we think this year, because prices are you know, going through the roof for the you know, Brent and also for gas, their gas prices are over thirty dollars per MCF, whereas you know they're close to nine dollars in the United States. I think they make the dollar about six dollars and eighty cents. That's a five point four PE. And another um, metric people look at was called discretionary cash flow. And if you add back the depreciation and amortization, the discretionary cash flow should be around. Um, 950 a share this year. So that puts it at four times discretionary cash flow, which is really on the low end. If you look at other global energy plays like a Chevron mm -hmm. or a Exxon, they're much more expensive. The company generates over 20 billion a year in free cash. It has a double A S&P credit rating. I mean, it's bulletproof, and it, it's a very good company. And you don't have much exposure. I looked up what the exposure was in Russia. It's about 1.5% of the energy. Now, the other thing is, because of the restrictions on Gazprom, this company now, which was number two in total gas delivery in Europe, now becomes number one. So they're in a really good position as we put you know, restrictions on Gazprom in Russia. Let me ask you finally before I let you go, and I want to revisit a, a pick because I think it's, it's a good time to do that. Three weeks ago or so, you picked KLA 10 core. Um, I ask you about that one specifically because of the conversation that's being had around semiconductors uh, right now. And, and I'm curious as to whether you still like the stock here and how you see that space right now. Sure. Because even with all the supply chain disruptions, people in the industry, LAM, KLA, and AMAT, They've all said we're going to see north of $90 billion worth of way to spend on the upfront portion, and it could go as high as $100 billion. So they're still in the driver's seat. There's plenty of demand is coming from people like Samsung, Intel, Taiwan Semi, as they try to go to 0.03 and 0.04 nanometers. 
I mean, across the board, there's a, there's a big demand for semiconductor capital equipment. I think KLA is an excellent company. It's well run, high return on equity, bulletproof balance sheet. Scott Black, I appreciate your time as always. Don't swing at the high one. Stay away from that high fastball. We'll talk to you again soon. That's, That's what Scott Ted Black. Williams used to say, and he was a yeah, pretty good was, hitter. He was pretty good. All right.